All right, so I got no opening text this morning. Um, we, we're going to continue on our study with Israel, so you guys could just remain seated. Uh, Brother Jordan, would you mind just praying? Just uh, blessing the message again, please. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I don't know how, how far we're going to get into the study. Probably we're going to have to go another another week. Um, I don't know. But all I know is we got a lot of scripture to cover, uh, a lot to talk about. And uh, that's the way to, to learn the book, okay, is we got to go scripture and scripture and scripture. And people say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm bored. I get bored with all this scripture and things, all this flipping and turning and going here and going there. Well, do you want to learn the book or not? That's just it. You want to learn or don't you want to learn? If you don't want to learn the book, well, then go somewhere else that goes preaches a 20-minute message with a little three-point outline, a little sweet, cute little poem in it, and then has you go on your way. There's plenty of churches out there that'll, that'll do that, but not here. That's not, uh, that's not how the Lord called me to, to preach and stuff. And ever since I've been called to preach, my, my prayer to God has been and always is continually to this day. I pray to the Lord, Lord, help me. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering in doctrine. I mean, you somebody could say, Well, that's vain repetition. I prayed that thing so many times because honestly, I need I need help. I need as much help to uh, c- continue doing that, opposed to the opposite of not doing that. Is if you guys never saw that verse before, go to Second Timothy chapter uh, four, verse number three. Right after, you know, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they, that's supposed, to, that's supposed to be the preachers, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Okay, and I do not want to be one of them teachers that just comes up here and, you know, tells you, you know, cute little things, just wants to tickle you behind your ears and itch your ears and stuff like that. You ever think of that as, you you ever see a a dog when you itch their ears? Especially my little cavalier cannoli with them big, long, floppy ears. The best spot he likes is right behind his ear. You keep going and keep going, and he can't get enough of it. He's practically drooling, and eventually he's he's falling asleep on me, you know, little guy. And uh, that's because all that's what a dog wants. All they want is just to be pleased, and then eventually they just want to kind of fall asleep. And I don't want to, you know, be a preacher that gets, you know, goes up here and so long with all these scriptures and ends up you're asleep. And I'm doing this actually to keep you awake. You know, the, the church is out there, the state of the people out there, they're the ones asleep. They're the ones getting their ear, ear tickled. They're so pleased and, and with pleasure and all that. But well, what, why can't they, what's their main trouble is the Bible says that they cannot endure I have that word underlined in my Bible. They cannot endure sound doctrine. They can't last. It's, it's too much work for them, so they tap out. You know, they can, they can endure a three-hour baseball game. They can endure a, a three-hour movie. They can endure a, a three-hour news program or hours of just scrolling on their phone and the social media. But when it comes to actually sitting down, learning the book, going Scripture with Scripture, flipping and turning... They tap out. They don't want nothing to do with it. They can't endure. They can't. They can't, can't last. So uh, we we pretty much have um, we don't have a we don't have a Sunday school hour for teaching, you know, and then a normal service for preaching, and then an evening service. You know, all we got is we got one hour on Sunday morning, and we got one hour on uh, on Thursday night. You know, and I try to do my best to give you both a, a, a combination of preaching and teaching. Um, so with that all being said, I do thank you all for coming here. I, I love, I, I love you all. And, uh, you, you all want to, I, I have a, you know, I understand you all here want to learn the book, right? You know, I, I could, I obviously could see that with, with audience and, but uh, occasionally, you know, I, I thank you for that. But occasionally I just have to remind you of, of, you know, the, the, the mission and goal of my ministry. And you say, well, what is it? It's to preach and teach God's book. <laughs> That's it. You know, you say, and, 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 and then eventually, yeah, I've, as, you, as I learn, if I'm teaching it correctly, it should stir you up to want to live 
a Christian life, which encompasses a lot of things. So you, you, I figure, you know, people say, well, what's the vision and goal with the church? Well, to, to, to preach and teach this book and, and stir you up to try to live a Christian life. And I feel if I do that, then God's going to end up blessing the rest of it and, and helping you guys, you know, try to live the Christian life. So I can already tell some of you are already like, all right, shut up, quit explaining yourself, get into the study. So uh, let's just start the lesson. That's what we're going to do. Now, a brief recap the, the, for the people of Israel. A brief recap. Number one, they're God's chosen people. Okay, God's chosen people. God called out Abraham from Ur of the Chaldeans and told him to go, to go to a land that God promised him. Okay, and Abraham was born of Syrian descent, uh, but migrated to the land of Canaan and became the first of what God would call the Hebrew people. And I looked up that word Hebrew. Okay, what's that even mean? Uh, he, Hebrew means to cross over, to pass through, and uh, derived from the word Eber or ever. So a Hebrew word, uh, a Hebrew word meaning the other side. That's what it means. Abraham the Hebrew. Uh, referring to Abraham who crossed in the land of Canaan from the other side of Jordan. So there's a, that's what that name actually means, which is interesting. It would be like our ancestors coming from Europe, uh, going to a land that would be called America. Now, I'm no longer an Italian. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, an Italian-American, but I'm, I'm an American. Uh, we like to say, you know, I, I'm Italian. You know, Italians are some of the most proudest people out there about their nationality. I'm sure you can, yeah, amen. Italians are real proud about it. You know, I'm Italian. You know, we're Italian. We're, we're like justified to, we like use it as, a, as an excuse to justify our loud, obnoxious behavior and stupid things like that. You know, but no excuse. But listen, you're not an Italian. I'm an American. If you're living in America, I don't care. You could say I'm German, I'm this, I'm that. You're American. Okay, you're, you're, that's what you are. And we, we, you know, by the grace of God, we got ourselves a land over here. We, we became a people. People around the world know us as Americans. So just got to, Abraham is the, is the first Hebrew with Syrian ancestry. Just like I'm an American with Italian ancestry and stuff. But there, there's, no, there, there's no record at all of the first Chinese person, the first Italian person, the first German person, Irish, Indian, Japan. There's no record of the first person of a, of a certain people. But there is of the Hebrew people. That's amazing. So we learned that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, the promised seed was to Isaac, which would inherit the promised land. Promised seed gets the promised land. Uh, Ishmael got his nations, uh, 12 princes in 12 nations he's going to get, but it wasn't the promised land. Okay, so Ishmael, Ishmael's descendants, they got the, the, the outskirts of the, of the promised land. Okay, so the, the outskirts of it, which would accompany... Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan up there, uh, Turkey, a um, little bit of Sudan. Uh, what else? What other ones are there? Oman, uh, well, Dubai, um, yeah, Iraq, Turkey, Sudan, Ethiopia. Uh, they got all those nations. All the land is, is theirs they're to the Arab people, but they're not to get the nation of Israel, which we actually we studied last week, the actual boundaries from the Nile River all the way to the great Euphrates, where that ends, where that ends, that should be the nation of, of Israel. Uh, you know, people get up all upset about the Jews took the land off the Canaanites, you know, and uh, the land of Canaan was filled with cannibalism, it was filled with giants, it was filled with pedophiles, it was filled with people committing bestiality, it was filled with every pagan abomination under the sun. <laughs> And God said, I want you to go to these people, drive all these wicked people out of that land, go into their land, take it for yourself because I'm giving it to you, and don't you do those abominations of those wicked people. There were wicked people over there, okay? So Isaac begot Jacob, God, uh, God, uh, who, God changed his name to Israel. We read, that, we read that verse, you know. Thou shalt no more be called Jacob, thou shalt be called Israel, okay? And for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Then Jacob birthed the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, what tribe was our Lord and Savior from? Anybody know that one? What tribe was he from? The line of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so there's just a little, little quiz there on, uh, on tribes. You got, I don't expect you to maybe to rattle off all of them, but yeah, at least you got to know our Lord's from the tribe of Judah. Okay, so uh, there's, there's been battles going on with the, with the Israelites versus the Philistines for, been going on for thousands of years in the modern term for 
Palestinians in Palestine, that, or the modern term for Philistine in Philistia is Palestine. That's something you, you, you got to know, okay? And that land clearly belongs to the Jews. So November 29th, 1947, the United Nations adopted Resolution 181, also known as the Partian Resolution, that would divide Great Britain's former Palestinian mandate into Jewish and Arab states. Jewish and Arab states in May 1948 when the British mandate was scheduled to end. Now, you know, clearly the nation of Israel today uh, does not consist of the nation of Israel that God intends it to be. You know, that's, that's I mean, that's clear. They got that little, little sliver of land there when God obviously intends there to be a lot more. Um, you know, obviously when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom, he'll reestablish the actual boundaries. He'll rewrite the maps and stuff and he'll have the exact boundaries of, of what that land's to be. Um, now, the reason why the Jews got this little sliver of land today uh, and why God allowed it, that to happen, we're going to see God's hand throughout a lot of stuff this morning, but why did God allow them just to get this little sliver of land was because of their disobedience. So turn to uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter uh, 11. Make your way to Ezekiel chapter 11. Now, the covenant of the land... The covenant, Let, that's, just a, that's just another word for like the deal, okay, like a deal. You know, the covenant of the land is unconditional. But the blessings associated with this unconditional covenant is conditional. That's, we, we, yeah, we have to understand that. And the only way that these children of Israel can occupy that land safely without wild men, the descendants of Ishmael being on every corner, the only way that they could occupy that land safely was if they were obedient to God. You know, you imagine that. Like, imagine if, if um, us Americans, and imagine if our people all surrounding us, Canada and, and Mexico, imagine if they were just straight up enemies of us, and they're, they're trying to break in, and we have to watch out for the Canadians and the Mexicans on every corner because they just hate us so bad that they're just trying to take this land. I mean, what a, what a life. You know, that's how they're living over there in Israel. People, they don't, you know, can't even go out and w w walk your dog or whatever without this conflict of the, the Muslims in the Jews, you know, the Muslims and the Jews, the, the descendants of Ishmael, the wild men, and the descendants of Isaac. You know, there's constant, constant uh, strife and stuff like that between them. Now, were, were, were the, are the Israel people, are they right with God today? No. We're going to see that. They're not right with God today. Now, look at Ezekiel chapter 11, verse number 14. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren... Even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, and all the house of Israel holy, uh, are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord. Unto us is a land given in possession. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I, I have cast them afar off among the heathen. Who did it? The Lord. I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries... Yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them uh, one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them uh, a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my ordinances, and so on and so forth. So oftentimes when, you, when we read this stuff here, God scatters them, and God brings them back. When, when, we, when we're studying, if we want to write the, message, the title of the message, we're studying Israel's history, the, fu the history and future of Israel. And oftentimes you read a passage like this, it's both given. Israel's history and Israel's future is given sometimes in the same verse and sometimes obviously with the verse right after it. You know, so they, they go hand in hand. Now come to Ezekiel 28. We'll look at it again. Same thing about this. They are scattered till this day. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Look at verse number 25. Ezekiel 28, 25. Verse 25, Thus saith the Lord God, When I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, 
Then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob, and they shall dwell safely therein, and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence, not scared to death on what was a Muslim going to shoot a rocket at me, RPG when I walk out my door or nothing. Now, right now, they're not dwelling with confidence, you know. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. The Lord their God, Jehovah. That's Jesus, even Jesus, Jehovah God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ, they're going to know that one day, is their God. Okay, come to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. I mean, the prophets are filled with this stuff. I'm, I'm coming up to Obadiah in my, in my daily reading, and minor prophets are, are filled with history and prophecy, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, everybody got to keep, keep reading your Bible. I got to keep, you know, exhorting you to read your Bible. I like a Lori showed me a little verse last week in Hosea. That's good to see people reading their Bible. You can't just, you know, count on me to, I do my best to feed you, but, you, you know, as you grow, you learn how to kind of feed yourself throughout the week and stuff like that. I uh, can only spoon feed somebody for so long, right? But uh, you see constantly this um, the, the the history and future of Israel. So read your Bible, guys. Make sure to read your Bible every day if you can. All right. Now look at uh, Ezekiel chapter. Let's see. I want Ezekiel thirty-six. Look at verse number. Let's see here. Verse number twenty-four. Ezekiel thirty-six twenty-four. Look what this says, Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. There goes your, your sprinkle baptism. <laughs> Is that for us today? No. We, we submerge. We, it's a picture of a, of a burial. You don't, uh, this isn't a picture of a burial. So the, the, the gospel, the grace of God, death, burial, and resurrection in the, is for the church age. That gets taken away, you know, in in the the uh, in different dispensations. That's something you got to get. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And ye shall be my people. And I will be, uh, and I will be your God. Come to Deuteronomy chapter 28 now. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. So again, the Lord tells them uh, he will scatter them. And he's going to bring them back into their own land. Now look at Deuteronomy 28. It's a pretty scary chapter here. Deuteronomy 28, this is the chapter about the, the, the blessings and the curses. And the blessings and the curses of Israel were all dependent upon their obedience. So look at, look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's start at verse number 15. Might skim through some of these too. Deuteronomy 28 verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I commanded thee to this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee uh, and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall thy basket in thy store. Cursed shall the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy, la thy land uh, and, and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou uh, be when thou comest in. Cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, uh, look at verse 21. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee. The Lord shall smite thee, verse 22, with consummation and with a fever and with inflammation and with extreme burning and with a sword and with blasting and with mildew. Uh, verse 23, thy heaven, thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass and the earth underneath thee shall be iron. Look at verse 24. The Lord shall make, make the rain of the land powder and dust. Uh, verse 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Uh, verse 26, in thy carcass shall be meat unto the fowls of the air. This is God speaking about his own people. And that's obviously a good, one of the proofs of, of this book was written by God because no people would write about their people and write about these things. You try to make your people look all great and glitzed up and glamoured up like you're a bunch of good people, but 
Look at these curses that, that God said, this is what I'm going to do to you, my people. You know, thank, in a way, thank, thank God that, you know, we're, we're, we're part of the church, man, the body of Christ. Pray, praise the Lord for that. Now, verse 26, thy carcass shall be meat. Verse 27, I will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emrods, those would be the hemorrhoids, and with the scab and with the itch where with thou can, cannot be healed. He's smiting them with STDs. Why? Because they're fornicating all the time. You know, they're, they're living a perverted lifestyle. Verse 28, the Lord shall smite thee with blindness or with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. You, know, you keep going on and on. Now, this is, that's a, a harsh rebuke. That's a tough chapter. And uh, now you can see the condition that Israel is in when their Messiah showed up. That's why we read about in the Gospels, Jesus Christ is healing the sick, cleansing the leper, uh, healing the blind. Healing the deaf people, uh, the Jews—they're under—they're paying taxes to Roman kings. They don't even—they're—they're they're under Roman occupation. They're in a mess. Why are they in a mess? Because they're being—they're being cursed. They're not obedient. That's why the Lord shows up on the scene. He's rebuking them left and right. This all goes back to Deuteronomy, the Book of Moses, the in—in in the Law of Moses. You know, look at Daniel chapter nine. Daniel chapter nine. Daniel knows about this. He read his, his Tanakh, his Old Testament. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verse number, you know, I'll smite thee with madness. You know, another one, demon possession is going on. The land of Israel is in a mess when their Messiah shows up, Jesus Christ. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verse number 10. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 10. Even verse 9, a little context. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. And this Daniel uh, talking here. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His laws, which He set before us by His servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed Thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey Thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. Daniel knew Deuteronomy 28. He's saying it. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against them. We just, we just read it, Deuteronomy. Uh, and, he, and he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us. By bringing, bringing upon us a great evil from under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. That's a serious statement. Nothing like this has ever happened to, the, to uh, a certain people than the Jewish people. Nothing like this in any history of any other people. Nobody ever saw nothing like what's going on with Jerusalem. Look at Daniel 9, 13. And it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our, iniquity, our, our iniquities and understand Thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought, brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is... Look at this. For the Lord our God is righteous in all His works which He doeth. For we obeyed not His voice. We got what's coming to us. He warned us time and time again. We disobeyed Him. Now look, what, look where we're in. We're in Babylonian captivity. Nebuchadnezzar's rolling over us. We're trying to worship. We've got to mandatory worship this guy and making us worship images and if it wasn't just for you know Daniel and, and his and his three companions there now Daniel okay the, the book of Daniel uh, you know the, the closing of the Old Testament the end of the minor prophets we, we get 400 silent years is what it's often called the 400 silent years and uh, they call it the silent years because there's no prophets there's no scripture and this is when actually the apocrypha writings were, were written by, in Greek also, you know, what, what are you writing in Greek? You guys are Jewish people for. So the, the, we reject the Apocrypha. This is when these writings came about, those 400 silent years. And uh, it's, n anyways, after 400 years, up shows a guy, John the Baptist. The first prophet shows up on the scene. The canon gets opened again. Scripture's being revealed. John the Baptist, the first prophet, shows up on the scene. He's pointing to their Messiah. Jesus Christ shows up, okay? And simply put... The Jewish people, Israel as a whole, they reject, they reject them. They, 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 they're the ones that said, you know, we have no king but Caesar, and his, his blood be upon us and our children. 
um, just was, you know, watch, listen or watching some article or something like that. Listen to some, I forget who said it, something about that, you know, the Passion of the Christ movie that, you know, Mel Gibson couldn't put that part in because he'd get charged with anti-Semitism. He didn't want to stir up the Jewish crowd there at that scene, you know, there. And I guess uh, what happens, you know, they just said, you know, free Barabbas, free Bar Barabbas, but they left out the part where the Jews said, you know, let his blood be upon us and our children. You know, they'd say, well, that's an anti-Semitic statement. That's what they said. <laughs> You know, that's, that's, what, you know, that's what they said there. Uh, so what, what they did as a nation, not so much as individuals, was they placed themselves under a curse of darkness and of, and of blindness uh, and ultimately ejection from the land that was supposed to be given to them. Now, in our, in our King James Bible, look at the book of Malachi, minor prophet. In our King James Bible, the last book in the Old Testament is Malachi, Okay, the last book in the Old Testament, you know, uh, I guess, I, you know, and obviously not doctrinally. We know in the dispensation after the cross enters into the New Testament. But it's interesting, the last book, we have the same books of the, that the Jewish people have. But the order of our books is different. So the last book in our Bible, look how this, look how this thing ends. Look at the last phrase in the Old Testament. Okay, and in, in, in this last chapter, there's, there's, there's three people that show up. Verse number four, Moses. Verse number five, Elijah. And these guys are coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. They're coming before the coming of the Lord. And then who else shows up? Obviously the Lord. So Moses and Elijah are going to show up again in the tribulation period. Uh, and then it says, verse six, for he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. You know, the, the fathers, present day to the children. Back in the day when they were, Israel was good. You know, the children of Israel. In the hearts of the children to their, to their fathers. There's unity. Lest I come... And smite the earth with a curse. Isn't that something? It's a conditional thing. If, if this don't happen, then, you know, then I'm going to come and smite the earth with a curse. So the last word in our Old Testament is a curse. And the last word in the New Testament is amen. You know, that's, that's a blessing there, aren't we? Oh, we glad that's not the last thing we read in our Bible is a curse. You know, thank God for the, for the New Testament. Now, come to Second Chronicles, because the last book that, in the Jewish Tanakh... The Jewish Bible, that's what, it, that's what they called it, the Tanakh, uh, the sec is Second Chronicles. That's their order of books. And, and it's Second Chronicles. Look at the last verse on that. Second Chronicles 36, 22. So the last thing that a Jew reads in his Bible, they don't have the book of Revelation. They don't have the, the New Testament. They don't, they don't know what's going to happen in the future and all that stuff. But Second Chronicles 22, here's what they have. Second Chronicles 36, 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, a Gentile king, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build them to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? Where are you at? All the Jews, where are you at? Where you've been scattered, okay? You've been out, uh, you've scattered about and stuff. The Lord his God be upon him, and look at this, let him go up. The last admonition to a Jew in their Bible is to go back to your land. Let him go up. I just think, it, think keep that phrase in your, in your head there, okay? Let him go up, remember that. Now, what are the Jews under today? Go to Galatians chapter uh, 13. Galatians 13 for what the Apostle Paul says, actually. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Sorry, Galatians 3, 13. Let's read this verse. Galatians 3, 13. Good verse here. Galatians 3, 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the what? The curse of the law. How did he do it? being made a curse for us. He became sin for us. That's a, that's a, what a mystery that, that is there. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And if you still claim to be under the law, and how do you get to heaven? Well, keep the law. You're under a curse. And the Jewish people to this day claim, we're still under the law. Well, you're still under a curse. So you, you got you to think about that. Now, um, we're going to look a little bit about the, the history and prophecy of this land. Okay, so 
in Christ's day, they rejected him. They rejected him when he was born. They wouldn't even want to go see where their king was born except for a couple shepherds and wise men. They rejected his birth. They rejected his ministry. They rejected his death. A couple of days later, he resurrects. They rejected the resurrection. And, uh, and then here, what seems to be a final rejection is in Acts chapter 7. Let's look at this real quick. Acts chapter 7, the end of Stephen's sermon. Look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse number 51. Remember last week we, we briefly covered some of this, but uh, Stephen did a tremendous job preaching the whole history of Israel really well. And then he gets down to the, you know, the, the last closing, I guess the conclusion of his whole sermon. And this here's how he ends it. Verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. They, number one, they reject the Holy Ghost. Verse number 52, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one? Who'd that be? Jesus. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have, rece who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. The law. You know, God showing up in a bush and speaking to him on the mount and... That would be like Jehovah God, God the Father. So the Jewish people, they rejected the entire Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Wanted nothing to do with, with anything of that, okay? Uh, they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ in total. And yet, come to Acts chapter 28, a good passage here. God has been so long-suffering to His people, they had so many chances to receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior and as their Messiah, uh, you know, we got by a guy named the Apostle Paul. Uh, constantly wanted to see his people, had a heart for his people. Okay, let's read this. Read this chapter here, Acts chapter twenty-eight, verse number seventeen. Uh, look at this, Acts twenty-eight seventeen. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, the chief of the Jews together, chief men. And when they were come together, he said unto the men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I had, not that I had ought uh, to accuse my nation of. And that's, something. He, he, that's Paul's little bit of patriotism Paul had. <laughs> He loved it. He loved his nation in so much he didn't want to say nothing bad against about, about his nation. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. I want to see Israel get saved. I want to see you guys turn to the Lord. I don't want to see you guys under this curse. I want to see you guys back in the land. You know, He knew all that stuff. And they said unto him, we neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any other brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, what sect? Christians. What do you think about this sect of the, the what do they call them, the, the, the sect of the Nazarenes or whatever, this, guy, these, these, this group of people that claim to follow Jesus. What do you think about, about them people? We know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them and concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. That's a Bible class right there, from morning till evening. He had all these chief Jews. Anybody wanted to hear him? He came to, his, to Paul, you know, Paul's uh, house there. And, and look, verse 24. Some believed the things which were spoken, and some believe not. No matter how much you expound to them in Scripture, how great of a preacher you are, there's going to be people in here that believe, some don't believe. They come in here, they hear, they listen, they believe, some walk out here, come to church forever, they don't believe. You know, that's just, that's, that's after a long, all day Bible lesson, you know. Some believed which were spoken, some believe not. Verse 25, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Okay, after, after Paul had spoken one word, word 
Uh, it, it was probably something, I wonder what that word was. It was probably Jesus or probably the word Gentiles. I mean, you talk about, you know, racism and stuff to a Jew. The, the, moment, the, the moment the word Gentile shows up, <laughs> Jews are gone. I don't want nothing to do with these, these dirty, filthy Gentiles. I mean, that's like, a, it's like a trigger word. They hear that, they want nothing to do. That's the beauty of the body of Christ, the unity. God hath broken down the wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentile, made both one in Christ Jesus. You know, it's like, what, what do you say? So, after that Paul had spoken one word, then well spake the Holy Ghost by Elias, the prophet of our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall not hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have, cl have, have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you, speaking of Jews, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, that they, uh, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. Verse 30, And Paul, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in, came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which uh, concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. He ain't going to tell me what to preach. Preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is his hired house. Paul's like on house arrest. Two whole years, and then we don't know. After two whole years, tradition would say he, he got delivered up to Nero and got beheaded, okay? But Paul has his little Bible, Bible school there in, in, his, in his own hired house. I, I like it. I like how Paul's life ends on that. Two whole years, like Paul, like a picture of like the church age. Two days, 2,000 years. I don't know. It could be something there, too. But um, so that's that's that. And it's interesting that they said some believed and some not. Okay, so this doesn't even it doesn't seem to imply that it was a real life changing, heartfelt belief. It was kind of like a, you know, yeah, I believe your points or I kind of don't, you know, believe your points and stuff like that. But the history of the Jews, they were they were a scattered people not dwelling in the land that God gave them. Uh, in, in history, it's called the diaspora. And it's, it, that thing started in, in 587 B.C., uh, exactly as God said it would happen. And so the, the, it was the dispersion, dispora, it's a fancy way of just the dispersion of the Jewish people uh, throughout the four winds we read in the Bible, north, south, east, and west. And uh, the, the, these Jewish people are scattered into the land of the Gentiles, which, which would be uh, the land of Africa, Spain, which is why Paul wanted to go to Spain at times, and uh, Rome. Um, then there's uh, Great Britain, uh, Russia, uh, Turkey, China, Baghdad. Uh, a, a huge portion of them went into Gaul, which we know as the land of the, of the Galatians. A lot of them went over to Greece and then to Corinth, uh, which we know Corinthians, and then France, and then Germany, and Poland. Uh, all throughout Europe, they were scattered. So it's pretty much as, as the Jews began to be set aside in God's plan, uh, they were scattered to the four winds. Then, then God's work began. We're going to go back to the, to the church. They began getting scattered. We're going to go back to the uh, dispensation chart. As they were getting scattered, okay, you think about this. I, they're going everywhere, okay? But then the church is going on just on a straight line. God just starts dealing with the church. He gets the work going. And uh, it's in the body of Christ is, you know, well, I got to say this too, Israel, it's, it's set aside temporarily as a whole. Okay, individuals can still get saved. Jews and Gentiles, barbarian and Greek, male or female, bond or free, all that. But predominantly, the body of Christ today is composed of Gentiles. Okay, G Gentile people, because the gospel, remember, the gospel is for whosoever. So there's no exclusion with that. But now it's interesting today we're seeing that the Jews are, are kind of making their way back into their, their land. And little by little through the course of history, we, you know, we saw this happening from the north. They started coming back from Ukraine and back from Russia and back from the, the Balkan areas and come back. And then we see it you know, over down in the south. They start coming, they go up from Africa and Ethiopia and uh, Egypt and Kenya and Morocco. They're, they're going back up to their land. 
And then from the east, we see them come back from India and China and, and Taiwan and Indonesia and Kazakhstan, all that stuff. And then they start coming back from the west. And then you remember, ah, the, the west. <laughs> okay, what about, what about the west? So when these Jews were, were scattered for 2,000 years, uh, they, they couldn't really find no, no safe haven. They were always persecuted. Uh, they, they, they couldn't go anywhere without being persecuted nationally. And there, except there was one place. It was almost like one place where the children of Israel couldn't go, uh, that they weren't persecuted you know, institutionally as a people. Uh, and it was, a, it was a strange place. It was a place, that, uh, a place of, the, of the Gentiles, and it was a land that they'd never known before. And it was a land that we know of as today as the USA. That's where they came. And you, and you think of this here, you know, figures I picked the dollars marker. Jeru USA Lum. But I mean, don't we believe God, you know, preserved the English Bible? Don't we believe every word of God is pure? We believe He has something to do with the English language in the last days? You know, there seems to be more than meets the eye than just that name, just that spelling of it. You know, I tried looking up, you know, when did they, when did they format and finalize that spelling? Because you have literally in the heart of Jerusalem, you got the USA just shows up in there. You know, I don't know if people would say that's just coincidence or whatever. It could be, but I think that's interesting. And uh, I looked on the jewishvirtuallibrary.org, okay? Countries with the largest Jewish population of 2022, number one, United States, 7 million 300,000, 47% of Jewish people live in the United States. Number two, Israel, 7,181,000. 7, we have more Jews in our land than we have Jews in the land that they even belong, that their land. That's, that's amazing. Then it goes France, number three, Can Canada, UK, Argentina, Russia, Australia, Germany, Brazil, South Africa, Hungary, Ukraine, Mexico, Netherlands, okay? Now that's something, okay, that's something. And maybe God did have something to do with that English spelling of Jerusalem, Jeru U.S. Salem, you know, and uh, that's just, just a thought. But and you, if you ever wonder why America got so many problems, uh, one of the reasons that we have such problems is because we keep messing around with this stupid idea that uh, this, this land for peace in, in, for the Middle East, and we, and we keep, you know, we keep cutting deals with Egypt and, uh, and the the PLO, which is the Palestine Liberation Organization, and whenever you mess with, you're, we're messing with God's land. And whenever you mess with God's land, uh, you, you know, tr trying to make peace and giving Israel this tiny sliver and allowing Palestine to be a state and, you know, finding ways to, to compromise what God actually said, you're not doing Israel a favor by, by messing around with that stuff. So for some history, okay, we're going to get in a little bit of history here. Uh, so even when the Jews tried going back to their homeland, uh, they, they faced persecution. And it, wa it, it wasn't until, you know, just like there was the lion of the tribe of Judah, well, then another country gets kind of rose up to power that had their national symbol as a lion. More, they called it a, a, a griffin, which is a, a lion with wings on it. Who would that be? That would be England. England and, and Great, Great Britain and stuff. And so uh, that England comes up on the scene, and uh, there, there became a movement that was called Zionism uh, to get the children of Israel back into their land. So at the end of, at the end of World War I, there was uh, what they had, what was called the, the Balfour Act, which allowed the Jews, it made it legal for the Jews to go back into their land. That was that we called that the Balfour Act at the end of World War I. And what's fascinating about history is who controlled that land? Well, who controlled that land before the Jews showed up was the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and, and who were they? They were Muslims, is what they were. And uh, they, they, they were defeated by the hands of the British Empire. This is World War I stuff here. And they looked up a little stat. The Ottomans had lost 59% of their land. The British cap captured uh, Basra, Baghdad, Jerusalem, Damascus, and Aleppo from the Ottomans. And uh, so it's interesting that in World War I, there was, there, was, there was a way, it was made a way for the, uh, you know, by way of England and by the USA, both of those allies, 
uh, to get the Jews to, to start to go back into their land with this Balfour Act. Okay, and um, now don't forget, you know, way back there in, in Ezekiel, God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scatter you and then I'm going to begin to draw you back again. So it's amazing, God operating uh, in, in the stage of, of human history, he began to draw the Jewish people back to their land. Uh, and, these, and these two superpowers, England and USA, for, you know, for some reason, they, 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 they took upon the burden to get these Jewish people back into their, into, uh, to reestablish Israel again. And it, it's much like that king that we read in the last second, uh, second Chronicles, uh, that guy Cyrus. And there was another one in the Bible, uh, uh, Darius. They were both kings of Persia who, uh, who, who got the Jews back into their land after Nebuchadnezzar wrecked everything, destroyed their temple, stole their goods. Then Cyrus, these, these kings, these Gentile kings, God laid on their heart, no, we're going to get you back in there. So there's, there's some in interesting things with those, those two kings. And then uh, a big deal when it came to uh, England and, and America, uh, helping them out. Now, that stuff to me, that stuff's amazing. Because that shows me that God just isn't operating in Sunday school and operating in your morning devotions and, and things like that. He's the one controlling the White House. He's the one controlling the Senate. He's the one controlling, uh, he's running everything to the counsel of his own will. He, he, even while using the free will of man, even while using the Muslims, even while using Satan to fulfill this book. The scriptures cannot be broken. It's a... It's, it's amazing, okay? So I hope, I hope that you're not bored yet at all with some of this history stuff, okay? So the, the children of Israel, okay, they were, they were allowed to go back legally with this Balfour Declaration Act, okay? It was legally, but it was, they weren't allowed like nationally. There's, no, there's still no state. There's no place for them. Uh, in, in the, for 2,000 years, these Jewish people, they've been without a state. And it wasn't until World War II uh, by the man of uh, a guy named Adolf Hitler, who some people actually th uh, believe that guy was actually Jewish himself. I don't know about that. Uh, a big, big figure shows up on the scene. Massive persecution. And it was an old preacher, uh, Bob Jones Sr., uh, who Dr. Ruckman went to school uh, under and studied under. He once said that World War I was to prepare the Jewish people for their land. It was to pre prepare the people. We're going to get you back in there. That's what World War I was really all about. Prepare the Jew for the land. And then World War II was all about preparing the land for the Jew. They, you got the people, but you got no land. World War II, they had to get the land. You know, so uh, in, in essence, pretty much at, at World War II, what you have is, is, is the defeat of the Axis powers. And for the first time in 1948, the Jews have a, have a piece of land that they can call home. That's amazing. At the end of World War II. And people say, you know, can you prove to me that, that there's a God? Yeah, just point him to the Jewish person. The Jew. You know, scattered to the four winds. Hated by all the Gentile nations. And, and yet it took the Gentile nations to, uh, to give them their land back. In 19, to, a piece of their land back at least. De declared to be a state. First time in 2,000 years they stepped foot on that soil. It, that, they, that they were scattered from you know and look these are these are all facts these are straight up facts you cannot argue with the facts you can argue with you know with the outcome and you could say well it was geopolitics or it was happenstance or whatever you know you can reject the bible and say all these things co coincidentally happened and to produce something that never was produced in human history before or you can say that there is a god in heaven and i like that verse in isaiah 46 declaring the end from the beginning from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. The Lord declares the end from the beginning. He knew how all this was going to unfold and His hand is operating through mankind. That's, that's, that's you know, I like just that thing. History. Well, it's His story. It's God's story. It's God's hand in all of it. Okay, so 1948, they took control and became an independent state. How do you think that sat well with the Arabs? <laughs> Not well at all, okay? Uh, that didn't sit well at all. The next big war was in 1967, and that was called the Six-Day War. Uh, you know, six days, it's interesting. Six days, I don't know, maybe God, re God rested on the seventh day. 
They finally had peace the seventh day, a six, the six-day war. And in those six days, Israel fought uh, five nations. They fought Egypt, they fought Jordan, they fought Iraq, they fought Syria, and Lebanon. All the surrounding nations, if you look at that map, all the nations came against Jerusalem. Okay, all their, their neighbors. Uh, they were outnumbered by 121,000 soldiers. They were outnumbered by 457 fighter jets. They were outnumbered by 1,786 tanks. Uh, and here, here's an abstract from Defense Tactical Information Center dot military. Uh, outnumbered almost three to one, fighting on three fronts, the Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, uh, handed its Arab adversaries a significant defeat from the 5th to the 11th of June, 1967. The resulting destruction of the Arab militaries and Israeli control of a significant terrain provided Israel valuable strategic depth in the following years. In the course of, of the one-sided war, the IDF demonstrated superior tactics while the Arab forces suffered for lack of competent leadership. However, the main reason for such a quick victory was the development of superior operational plans. The IDF expertly balanced the operational factors of time, space, and force to attack the Arab centers of gravity and achieve uh, specific operational objectives, all of which contributed to the national goal to ensure the survival of Israel. And that's, pretty, that's a pretty amazing war that they fought right there. And you could, I looked up on a jewishvirtuallibrary.org. They have uh, top 17 miraculous Israeli military victories in their in their archives. These in in all that stuff is within within history. But how many times do we read in the Bible that Israel is outnumbered? They seem all hope is lost, and God gives them the victory. This is in their people. They started with this. Their backs against the wall. They're in the Red Sea. They just fled out of Egypt. Babies, women, children. I don't know if they brought a bunch of weapons and stuff like that with them. You know. They're, they're, they go, they're back. What are we going to do now, Moses? We're backed up against the sea. Pharaoh's army is charging at them. I mean, imagine that scene. Scared to death. Babies crying. People screaming, yelling at Moses. Moses takes that staff. God parts the Red Sea. They start marching through that thing. As they go along, God swallows up all Pharaoh's army in the river, in the Red Sea. I mean, that's, a, that's just amazing. You know, then right after Exodus, uh, Joshua chapter 10 this is, this is right after Joshua took Ai. You could probably read this on your own time, but you probably heard, this, heard the war, about the war before. Uh, Joshua, right after he took Ai, he feared, he feared a place called Gibeon uh, because it was greater and mightier than those in Ai. And uh, they attacked in the night while the Canaanites slept. And uh, Joshua 10, 8, the Lord says, Fear them not, for I deliver them into thy hand. They shall, there shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them and suddenly and went up from Gilgal all, all night. Uh, I was reading about the, you know, that when they came up, they had no food. They had this massive long hike to get up to here. They were probably exhausted. You know, how are they going to fight all these people? Then verse 10, 10, the Lord disconfitted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter upon Gibeon and chased them along the way to go up to Bethron and smote them at Aska and Maccadiah, all these places. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel and as they were going down into Bethron, that the Lord, the Lord cast down great stones from heaven, which fell upon them at, unto Azka, and they died. There were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. <laughs> the Lord calls it the rain hailstones. It's, not, it's killing these people. <laughs> They're enemies. You know, the, that's, a, that's amazing. Joshua, and then Joshua was so filled with the power of God after that victory. He walked outside and said to the sun, stand now still. Moon, stay thou in thou place. And it stood still. And they all marveled and said, never a man, never did God hearken unto man like he just did. He told the sun to stand still. You go outside and try that all day and night. I mean, that's a, that is, uh, I just pictured Joshua filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Just so confident in his God, you know. And I like that. There was no day, that, there was no day like that before or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. Always fighting for his people. Then there's the battle of uh, Soka. We all know this one. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, a young shepherd boy armed with a slingshot and five smooth stones uh, you know, takes on a 10-foot-tall champion of, of the Philistines. 
uh, of, of Palestine, a champion of the Philistines named Goliath. You know, and, and you, we all know that Goliath was so cocky and so confident. What do you, what do you think? I'm, I'm, I'm some dog or something like that? You're, you, this little David was Rudy and little young little boy coming at me. And he, he, he's cursing, you know, Goliath is cursing their God or cursing our God, you know. And uh, David, he's cursing him back. Curse, curse you and curse your gods. And David runs at him. I mean, it's hard enough to, to sling a sling, just, you know, standing still and hitting your target. The little kid, he's running at him. And Goliath, you know, they're, they're meeting each other to battle. Goliath forgot his helmet. He slings that stone. It's sunk in his head like a 44 caliber bu bullet. <laughs> He, and Goliath falls back. David gets his, gets his guy's heavy sword, cuts his head off, takes it back to the camp as a trophy. I got his head. And then it says, you know, the rest of that battle, all Israel pursued all the Philistines, and they all fled and ran away, a bunch of little girls, you know. God, and they're slaying, the, they're slaying the Philistines. What victory that, that, that God brought his, brought his people. They got the W again. Now, how about, how about Gideon? You need to read the Battle of Gideon. Remember that whole story? He started, I forget, he started out with 100,000 men or something like that. 100,000 or 300,000 men. Who's, who's with me? You know, and the thing boils down to only 300 men. How in the world are, are, are 300 men going to go up against 135,000 Midianites? And not only that, God, God wrought a great victory with those 300 men. What was their, what did they, what did they use? 300 trumpets and, and 300 torches. And they were, so, they were so discombobulated, they were killing each other and stuff like that. How in the world did they get victory in that? God's power. I mean, that's a miraculous victory in, in the nation of Israel. So that's a, you, you can go on and on with, with these battles. Now, that's, that's who our God is. Okay? And, and if, if He got the power to overcome their battles in a miraculous way like that, don't you think our God would give, give us some power to, to fight our sins, to fight our, our little flesh? You know, to fight the world, to, to go up against the, the devil and, you know, put the armor of God on and stuff. You bet he will. If he did all that for, for his people and that stuff. So that's the history. That's, six, that's 1967. The Israelites got back into the capital city of Jerusalem. Then the wars go on. Uh, 1974, there was a war called Yom Kippur. In the 1980s, there was the war with Lebanon uh, and Hezbollah. Uh, and then there's the, them always fighting the PLO and a guy named Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian people. And uh, the war just continued to wage on. Uh, but Israel got stronger and, and richer, but there was still some confusion. Uh, the rest of the world, okay, and USA at, that, at, at a time, only recognized Tel Aviv as their capital. And that was the whole thing about the Six-Day War, to, to, get that, to get Jerusalem back. Okay, but it was never recognized as the... Capital. Everybody knows tel they would say Tel Aviv was the capital. But uh, until a, a Catholic-backed, Jesuit-trained, loud-mouthed businessman from New York came, uh, came up on a scene in, in, in his presidential reign, 2016, a guy announced, recognized Jerusalem as Israel's uh, capital. So, you know, then what's next? Whatever happened to that guy, Donald Trump? 2020, everybody got confused. Okay, what happened? How oh, the guy he lost? You know what, what what happened? Well, there was a little thing called the Abraham Accords. I'm going to read this, okay? Because remember what I said before: land uh, is an issue with God, and that whole land belongs to the nation of Israel. Now, in Trump and his administration, they made the most fatal mistake that they could have ever made. And you say, yeah, listen to Fauci. Well, that was maybe number two mistake, okay? <laughs> The number, the number one mistake that they made, that, that administration, is messing around with God's plan. Got him in trouble. Lost the election, you know, and we're getting all that stuff. But here, listen to this Abraham Accords declaration. This is the actual document all signed by Trump. Uh, some, I probably all the, I, I forget, the Middle East, Middle East people and stuff. Listen to this. We, we, the undersigned, recognize the importance of maintaining and strengthening peace in the Middle East and around the world based on mutual understanding and coexistence, as well as respect for human dignity and freedom, including religious freedom. We encourage efforts to promote interfaith and intercultural dialogue to advance the culture of peace among the three Abrahamic religions and all humanity. It all sounds good. Huh? We believe that the best way to address challenges is through cooperation and dialogue, 
that the uh, and that developing friendly relations among states advanced advances the interest of lasting peace in the Middle East around the world. We seek tolerance and respect for every person in order to make this world a place where all can enjoy a life of dignity and hope, no matter their race, faith, and ethnicity. That sounds good. We su we support science, art, medicine, and commerce to inspire humankind, maximize human potential, and bring nations closer together. They can't say we support the Bible. <laughs> but they, there's no way they could say some, anything like that. We seek to end radicalization and conflict to provide all children a better future. We pursue a vision of peace, security, prosperity in the Middle East and around the world. Uh, in this spirit, we warmly welcome and encourage by the progress already made in establishing diplomatic relations between Israel and his neighbors in the region under the principle of the Abraham Accords. We encourage ongoing efforts to consolidate and expand such friendly relations based on shared interests and shared commitment to a better future. So, no Bible. And they're, it's almost like they're compromising. You guys stay in your land. Just, you know, give this, let Israel have this little sliver. And the whole land belongs to Israel. You can't get around that. We don't stick up for the Bible. You put yourself in a, no, pol you can never be a politician and stick up for the Bible. You say, I'm going to be a politician and I'm going to go out and I'm going to stick up. No, you're not. Eventually, you're going to fail and you're going to compromise. You're going to, you're going to try to please men and not stick up for what the Word of God says. It'll get you in trouble. So here, okay, so here we are. Okay, now, as all this is happening, remember the church. That's us. Uh, and and the, the, the diaspora, the, the wars, the land of Israel. Okay, and we are, we are right at the end of the church age. And as Israel is beginning to go up to their land, we are going to start to go out. We're going to start exiting this world eventually. And you can make a couple of things. They're going to be a falling away. Then there's going to be a rapture. But as Israel starts to go up, um, you know, church is going to go out. We're getting ready to, to, to get out of here. And uh, the Jews now, they have their land. Uh, they have their capital. They will, eventually they will have their temple. They're going to have prophets. They're going to have 144,000 of them. They're going to have a, probably have a priest. If they have a temple, they're going to have to have some type of priest. Uh, but what, they're, what are they going to be missing? They're going to be missing their king. And they haven't had a great king, really, since King Solomon. They haven't had one since. And, you know, let's go in a full circle here. The, there was an Abrahamic covenant for the land. Then there was a Mosaic covenant given to this people, the law of Israel, the commandments. And then there was one more covenant called the Davidic covenant. And that was the agreement that God said to David, there's going to be your, your, your heir is going to sit on this throne. Okay, and uh, way back 30 AD, that king came. And that king's obviously going to come again. All right, now everything is setting up. Everything is setting up perfect. They got their land, the city. They're going to have a temple, their sacrifices, but they need their king. So, uh, you know, why, why do we why do I take the time to go over all this is because we're not, we're not living in a closed environment. We're living in a world where the God of heaven is, is, is directing and leading and guiding history, which we're seeing it being unfolded, okay? And you, you could, it's cool, you could, look to, you could look to creation and see that there is a God. You know, you, you can look to your heart and your conscience and see that there is a God. You, could, you can look to quantum science and how all the technicalities behind that and see there's a God that fine-tuned everything. You can look to this book and see there's a God. And you can look to the people of Israel, that, that people, that nation, and you can see that there is a, there is a God that, that rolleth in heaven. And uh, Israel's ready. So you gotta, we got to watch the, watch the temple, watch the nuclear buildup, you know, watch China and, and the, the, the kings of the east align themselves to get ready to go against Israel and watch the New World Order. And, you know, some of the New World Order people, they're led by a bunch of, you know, rogue Jewish people. And uh, watch Russia and watch it all unfold. We're going to watch that Bible <laughs> because it is, it is far more up to date than any news program that you can watch. Far more up to date. You know, the old saying, this is more up to date than, you know, tomorrow's newspaper and all that. Way more up to date. And, um, if, that's, it's amazing. So it, God dispersed them. It is God that dispersed them. It is God that's going to bring them back. It is God that's in control. And we live in very exciting times. 
because we're getting a chance to see this all unfold. And listen, I've been, do, I've been doing more study in, in 2 Thessalonians a lot, a passage that always troubled me. Oh, I mean, it's, it, it, is a, it is a tough passage to teach. You have so many various Bible-believing teachers that disagree with how this thing goes. Now, it's like, like an like illustration would be something like, you know, my, we're anticipating Christ to come back. And I'm telling you to well, watch for this, watch for this, so immediately I'm going to get an accusation. Oh, you're telling people not to watch for Christ. You're, you're telling people to, you're, not, you're trying to steal crowns from people. because you're not. If you tell a kid, look, it's your birthday next month, and you want to know how it's your birthday, well, look at, this, look at the leaves starting to change. Are you ruining that kid's an- anticipation for his birthday to come in? No. So by no means should I be ruining your anticipation of Christ coming when I'm saying, watch for these things. Watch for this, this, these, these people going against the nation of Israel and what's going on and stuff. And no, Don't sit there and watch the news all day long and stuff. We get little articles, you know, get, go, on, go back to the Bible. But watch these things unfold. The temple being rebuilt, the, the wars going on, and all that stuff. Mark of the Beast system coming up. All that stuff getting, getting closer and closer, we're going to get out of here. Okay, so I'm not trying to steal away any, anybody's anticipation of a, the Lord coming back, but that should get us more excited. All right. Now I'm going to close that Ezekiel 11, 17. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye, ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Next week we'll get into the time of Jacob's trouble a little bit, talk a little bit more about that, and we'll be hopefully through with this. That's... Uh, it's all good stuff. All good stuff. Anything you preach and teach you from the Bible is going to be good. So let's bow our heads. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lord, that you are, we could constantly see your hand involved throughout history, throughout mankind, Lord, and even throughout the wars and all the, the judgments uh, that, that, that you've poured upon uh, this world and upon your people. Um, there's just so much evidence that there, that there is a God out there. And so much evidence that I'm so thankful that you came down uh, to close to 2,000 years ago and revealed yourself to mankind, the creator of the world and the savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Lord, for dying for our sins, for the sins of your people, for the sins of Gentiles, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so thankful that uh, I, I was a whosoever. I, I fall in that category. And um, Lord, just continue to give us eyes. Uh, to see and ears to hear and the understanding heart to be able to uh, to discern the times and seasons that we're in and just to, not to get anybody fearful or afraid but excited to look for your coming. We know it's getting close to stir them up, Lord, to live a Christian life, sanctified, holy, uh, doing the Christian duties and service and just uh, help us, Lord, not, be, not, not to be weary and not to tap out in the end. And, uh, and, and fall away or, or just help us stand strong in these things and take a firm stance when, uh, when it seems to be every enemy is against us. But we know that you will prevail and we will have the victory in Jesus through you, Lord. We thank you so much and love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right, let's sing, uh, let's sing one more song here. We're going to sing again, Amazing Grace. We're going to sing that again. <laughs>